This is Glenn Robinson, President of the World Affairs Council of the Monterey Bay Area. I would like to welcome you to our newest edition of Quick Takes on International Affairs. Please enjoy this talk and do consider joining the World Affairs Council. Hello, I'm James Russell from the Department of National Security Affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. And I'm here uh, to talk about the U.S.-Israeli relationship uh, for the Monterey World Affairs Council. Let me do a screen share and pull up some slides to get uh, started here. Okay, what I'm gonna be talking about, as I said, is uh, U.S.-Israeli relations in the 21st century. Um, this is a, an important issue for uh, the World Affairs Council to be discussing or thinking about, uh, particularly in context of the recent events in Gaza, uh, in which, uh, which, which was only the latest flare up uh, between Israel and the, uh, the Palestinians, both in the West Bank and on the Gaza Strip. So at the outset here, I wanna talk uh, about and start with the point that the uh, opinions that you're hearing or the information that you're going to hear in this uh, brief presentation, these are my opinions only. They are not the views of the United States government, the Department of the Navy, uh, or the Naval Postgraduate School. Um, the purpose of this brief presentation is to frame the contemporary challenges facing the U.S.-Israeli partnership um, and to do that, we'll have to go through a little bit of the history of this relationship to understand some of the current pressures we are facing um, in, in this relationship, which has historically uh, been around at least since the, since the creation of the State of Israel uh, in 1948. So um, the, the sort of upfront conclusion of the talk uh, is that this relationship is undergoing profound challenges and um, pressures for change are building in the relationship uh, from both sides. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to suggest in this talk that uh, things will dramatically alter in this relationship today or tomorrow or even the next day, but that over time, I think it's reasonable to expect that both countries um, will increasingly go their own way, so to speak. So a little bit of background on the circumstances uh, of, uh, of today, so to speak. Um, uh, which are, are, of course, one of the narratives of this discussion, that the circumstances that were uh, present when the state of Israel was created have changed very dramatically as of today, between, between then and now. So Israel is classified today by the World Bank as a high-income country um, with a nominal per capita gross domestic product of $47,000 per person. So in terms of the, uh, the world, this places them in the high income category. And in terms of uh, uh, sort of parallel uh, states around the world, it places them on a par or in the neighborhood of countries like uh, New Zealand, Canada, uh, and Hong Kong. Uh, Israel's GDP today is about, is estimated at about 395 billion, uh, which is a little bit bigger, for example, than the, uh, the state of Maryland. Uh, in the United States. Another one of the important facts uh, that you wanna think about um, is that um, the United States has uh, traditionally uh, been uh, making Israel uh, uh, eligible for large amounts of annual military assistance. So the United States gives Israel about $3 billion annually in military aid. They're the largest recipient of that aid in the world. Most of that money is used by Israel to purchase, uh, by Israel to purchase American defense equipment, uh, but some of it is also used inside Israel itself to build uh, uh, Israeli equipment. Um, and Israel has a quite uh, sort of robust and mature uh, indigenous uh, uh, defense industry. Um, as another sign of the sort of state of play in the relationship today, uh, the United States uh, routinely vetoes UN Security Council resolutions that are critical of Israel. For example, in the recent uh, war in Gaza, the United States uh, vetoed a number of resolutions that the council sought to pass, which uh, called for the war to end and condemned Israeli aggression. Um, so um, the, the net effect of 
the many, many years of, of, of the US support is that today Israel sits as the unquestioned military superpower of the region. They, they, they have the best armed military, they have the most advanced equipment in the world provided by the United States. And lest we also sort of, or it should be mentioned, that they are the region's only nuclear state. Israel is thought to have exploded a, a nuclear device sometime in the mid to late 1960s. The nuclear program was created with the assistance of the French. Um, so they are the world's conventional military superpower and the region's only uh, uh, nuclear state. Um, another important fact uh, was that the Trump administration moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Previous administrations had resisted doing this. And this was uh, extensively reported on in the New York Times that this decision to move the embassy was taken after multi-million donations by the casino magnate Sheldon Adelson uh, during the election. Uh, another of the salient facts, of course, is that the West Bank has been under military occupation since 1967. Uh, in Gaza, uh, the Gaza Strip uh, has been under blockade. Um, about 600,000 Israelis now live on the West Bank uh, and in Jerusalem. And uh, over the last decade, uh, well, much longer, of course, perhaps the last quarter odd century, uh, they have aggressively been expanding settlements um, in the West Bank uh, in particular uh, through the evictions of Palestinians uh, and the seizures of Palestinian territories. So, um, on the West Bank, uh, as far as the Palestinians are, are concerned, re and this really dates the, to the sort of uh, the mid to late 1990s, um, in which the West Bank has been increasingly sort of cut up by the Israelis with a series of uh, road networks and checkpoints. Uh, and now, of course, uh, uh, separation barriers and walls uh, separating the, the Palestinian from, from, from uh, a settler territory. Uh, and there are today about 2.16 uh, Palestinians that live on the West Bank under Israeli military occupation. Uh, and another 1.79 live in Gaza, uh, which is under a sea and land blockade, as you can see here on the picture on the right of the slide. So what is this, uh, what is the uh, sort of, what can I say about the background uh, to US policy? Um, the, the United States has historically supported what we would refer to as a two-state solution. Uh, and what do we mean by that? A, a solution in which we have a, a Palestinian state and Israeli state sort of coexisting, peacefully coexisting side by side. Um, and the idea was that, uh, initially at least, was that the United States would serve as an honest broker between these two parties, would seek to serve as the sort of mediator between the two parties. Um, uh, and of course, the history of this really gets underway um, after the 1973 war, um, when the United States uh, steps into the breach, if you will, to uh, the, in the Nixon administration to resupply uh, Israel, which had experienced some setbacks on the battlefield. But then President Carter comes into office and perhaps his crowning achievement, achievement, of course, is the 1979 Camp David Peace Accords, in which the uh, Israelis reach agreement with Egypt to hand back the Sinai with uh, sort of uh, assurances that they will seek to address Palestinian grievances um, uh, for the territory on the West Bank, uh, which of course has, has still to this day not happened. Uh, but the other part, uh, another important contributing part of this is the, the, the Clinton administration sponsors the Israeli-Jordan Peace Treaty in 1974. And of course, the Clinton administration also supports what's, what is then called the Oslo process in which the Palestinians uh, and the Israelis uh, meet um, uh, independently of the United States and, and start working out the sort of dimensions of what we all thought at the time was going to be the exchange of land in exchange for the Palestinian land for pledges of peace. Of course, the Oslo Accords eventually uh, sort of collapse, particularly with the assassination of the uh, labor prime minister Rabin, um, and the, the Clinton administration makes a, a big sort of attempt it, near, near the end of its administration at Camp David II uh, to come to some sort of more comprehensive agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. This collapses in the end. And of course, fingers are pointed on both sides about who was actually responsible. 
But I think you can look back on this period and say that the end of the Clinton administration really represents sort of the end of this era of the United States seeking to uh, position itself as an honest broker uh, and, and make a, uh, 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 an equitable agreement for both sides. Since then, there, I don't think there's any question that the, the issue has gradually slipped in terms of its emphasis in US strategy and foreign policy. And I, don't, and I think there is no question that, that in the United States, at least, um, the, the, the settlement of the Arab-Israeli dispute is no longer really regarded as a particular US foreign policy a priority. For example, in the recent um, uh, uh, war in Gaza, the Secretary of State, um, and in previous years, it would have been unthinkable that a Secretary of State would have sort of sat on the sidelines. But the, the truth is, is that the Secretary of State uh, was at a meeting with Arctic states as the war was going on, uh, which maybe uh, it's sort of a, a symbolic, I think, of, again, the decreasing emphasis that the United States has placed on this. And what this has meant, uh, of course, is that the Palestinians, uh, for the most part, uh, have been abandoned by the, U the United States and been forced to live, of course, in this what looks like a perpetual uh, military occupation. So um, with this as kind of this background of where how we got to where we are today, I'm just going to briefly highlight uh, what I see as some of the pressures on the, the, the U.S.-Israeli relationship. The first of these, and I'll sort of uh, sort of use the levels of analysis, if you will, uh, to kind of try to unpack this a little bit. The first of which is geopolitics. Um, so um, all of the relationships that the United States has in the, in, in the region today, if we look at Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel, Turkey, um, all of these relationships took form in the Cold War, right? When the United States was engaged in this face-off with the Soviet Union, and we were competing uh, for influence with the Soviets in the Middle East. And our relationships with these countries were part of the attempt, uh, again, to forestall uh, uh, Soviet influence, okay? So if we fast forward from this period, the 60s, the 1970s, and the 1980s today, there's a, a growing consensus that today, the era of today, the 21st century, the Middle East is frankly seen as less important to the United States. Um, uh, the, the Obama administration, for example, made a much sort of ballyhooed announcement of the shift or a pivot to Asia, uh, which, uh, of course, was uh, widely debated at the time. But it's really emblematic, I think, of a growing recognition in the United States that um, the Middle East has not been particularly kind to the United States. We, we, we can't point to the sort of a, a series of accomplishments over the last quarter century, despite our many efforts to try to solve the region's problems or help the region to solve its problems. And there's a sense that we should be moving to the Indo-Pacific um, uh, where the stakes uh, are much higher. The second part of this, of course, in, 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 as this, this sort of shift in strategic priorities uh, is that there is this growing sense, again, I think in the foreign policy community that our main regional partners, and I include Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel, Turkey, are all engaged in various represent, repre, uh, reprehensible behaviors, uh, which various parties and various communities uh, find objectionable. Um, um, and uh, so this is, uh, uh, again, another factor in, in uh, us choosing perhaps to want to de-emphasize these partnerships and and shifting attention uh, to the Indo-Pacific with, again, this, this sort of idea of, a, of questions raised about the relevance of these relationships in the 21st century as the region is declining uh, in importance to the United States. The second thing I would say uh, also, which is placing uh, pressure on the relationship, are the domestic politics of both countries. Foreign policy is a, is a function, of course, uh, or, or uh, is, a, is certainly influenced by domestic politics. And it is clear that over the last quarter odd century in particular, that domestic politics in both Israel and the United States have gone and undergone important shifts. In Israel, for example, uh, politics uh, in Israel, a parliamentary democracy, a healthy parliamentary democracy, are increasingly dominated by religious political parties that have been pursuing, um, uh, aggressively pursuing, I might, I might add, this idea of annexing the West Bank, 
ex aggressively expanding um, uh, Israeli settlements in, in, on territory that, at least according to the United Nations, is, is not Israel's, <laughs> right? Um, the, the, the net effect of which uh, is, of course, the activities of these parties, the changing of the political landscape in Israel, is that the two-state solution is increasingly, uh, and is seen by some, uh, I, should, I should add, is nearly impossible at this point. And with the, with the sort of lack of interest in, in peaceful coexistence with the Israelis, um, uh, there's really sort of no end in sight for the military occupation um, on the West Bank, as well as the, as the blockade on Gaza. So, so we shifted to, to, to the United States um, and, and your viewers, uh, the uh, World Affairs Council uh, people must also be aware that, of course, US domestic politics are also shifting. Um, and that as a result, foreign policy is also changing as well. Um, and it used to be that Israel, the, the support for Israel pretty much was across the spectrum of, of uh, the US uh, major political parties, the Republicans and the, and the Democrats. Uh, but increasingly in, in recent years, the progressive wing of, of the Democratic Party has come to object uh, to Israeli behavior, alleged war crimes, for example, um, uh, in Gaza in the recent war. It's one, one of the uh, issues that, that uh, has been highlighted. Um, uh, per but perhaps most importantly, this the progressive wing of the Democratic Party also objects to the setting up of this de facto apartheid state, right, by Israel, uh, which is separating its communities, creating different classes of citizenship, uh, but ultimately, the result, net result of which will be to deny the legitimate rights uh, to thousands of disenfranchised Palestinians. And uh, for parts of the Democratic Party, they have a, a, a problem with this. Um, uh, um, uh, and with, with this, uh, uh, the, the, this trajectory uh, uh, within Israel. And then, of course, you have also, and again, this has been written and widely written about in the press, you have this sort of gradual alienation between the Jewish communities in Israel and the U.S. due to the uh, 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 factors that uh, I've talked about above, uh, various Israeli behaviors that are deemed to be uh, objectionable. So, so where does this leave the relationship? Where, in other words, where do we go from here? Uh, it's that um, one, one of those people, people such as myself, professors who teach international politics, um, there's, there's this sort of rule that you have uh, that, you, that we use in the classroom, which is that there's no such things as forever relations in international politics. Circumstances change. Relationships move along with them. This is sort of one of the truisms of politics, right? Um, uh, uh, for example, the... Uh, a great partnership between the United States and Europe, for example, that was built in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s in the Cold War, the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and um, a very strong sort of partnerships, transatlantic partnership between us and the Europeans. And the fact is, is that uh, this is an example in the, in the current century, um, you know, those relationships aren't as strong as they used to be, and it's because politics have changed, uh, uh, and the geopolitics surrounding the relationships uh, have changed. Um, so uh, um, the geopolitics has changed, circumstances of the relationship have changed, so this is one of the, again, sort of inexorable pressures on, on uh, the, the U.S.-Israeli partnership. Uh, the second thing, of course, is that uh, I would say that, okay, so it's unlikely that we're going to wake up tomorrow and see the dramatic changes in the relationship, but there's certainly very strong support for Israel in the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party establishment. So I don't mean to, wouldn't want to suggest that there aren't strong constituencies still supporting this relationship. But my argument is that over the long run, um, uh, the, the relationship is going to be increasingly undermined by diverging interests and in domestic politics. Um, and that this, this is not really very surprising. It's certainly a truism in, of international politics. And I, I think the, the rules, the sort of basic rule of no such thing as forever relations in international politics will eventually apply to this relationship too. So with that, I will conclude and, and uh, uh, hope you have enjoyed this. Thank you. Bye.